My name is Nick Valeriani, and I have the distinct privilege to be the Chief Executive Officer of the West Health Institute and the Chief Executive of West Health. For those of you who are not familiar with us, West Health is an initiative combining four separate organizations with the shared goal of lowering healthcare costs by creating innovative, patient-centered solutions that deliver the right care at the right place at the right time. They include the West Health Institute, an applied medical research organization, the West Health Policy Center in Washington, D.C., our West Health Investment Fund, and the West Health Incubator. Now, our organization was founded four years ago by Gary and Mary West, successful entrepreneurs and pioneering philanthropists with a deep commitment to lowering health care costs in the United States. To this day, they are still our sole funders, making us truly independent and not partisan. The West also have a passion for supporting the wellness and independence of low-income seniors. Through our foundation and in partnership with other nonprofit organizations, they invested in senior community centers of San Diego to build the Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center, a state-of-the-art facility that serves more than 2,000 low-income seniors each year. Today you'll hear more about the Senior Wellness Center and Passport to Health, technology-enabled care coordination model that was developed right here at the Institute. It combines medical and wellness care, social services, and remote biomarker monitoring to track senior health. It is just one example of the technology the Institute is, is evaluating to advance senior care. Now, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2050, excuse me, in 2050, the number of Americans age 65 or older is projected to be 88 and a half million. I guess I'm going to be this. <laughs> Here in San Diego County, the number of seniors is expected to grow by 130% to almost a million people by 2030. This exponential growth of the graying of America has created an urgent need for reimagining healthcare and brings new challenges to this generation, which is why we are all here today. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel of experts who will discuss how they are improving quality, increasing safety and care, as well as lowering costs in the region's at-risk seniors. So on our panel today, we have Paul Downey, President and CEO of Senior Community Centers, Dr. Richard Della Pena, Chief Medical Officer of Healthcare Provider Independent, and Dr. Zia Aga, the Acting Director of Health Services Research at the Veterans Affairs here in San Diego. They are joined by our moderator, Dr. Joe Smith, who is the Chief Medical and Scientific <coughs> Officer here at West Health. So one more thing before I turn it over to Joe. The West Health team will be following the conversation on Twitter. We encourage you to do the same. Join us at, at West Health and hashtag West Idea. We'll also be posting the video of this event on our website. So again, on behalf of the entire leadership team at West Health, thank you for joining us this morning. And I'll turn the session over to Dr. Joseph. Well, um, I should start off by saying you know, we, we have about 50 minutes together, and uh, that'll never do justice to the issues that challenge uh, the, our graying seniors as well as our healthcare systems that help to care for them. And so I'd encourage you not to think of this so much as an event, but as the beginning of a process, a, a, kind of a conversation that's gonna continue uh, well past today. And so um, we're happy to participate in that conversation because clearly, these are a set of challenges that are just not going to go away. We're going to have to deal with them uh, both collectively as well as individually. 
I want to I want to start this off. Uh, I've we we preloaded the group here with some questions so that they understand that these things are not completely out of the blue. And I'm not going to depart from that too much in order to make sure that your heart rates all stay uh, in the normal range. But, but I'd ask I'd ask the 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 group. You know, in San Diego has some unique features. You know, we we're talking earlier it's America's finest city. I'm sure it has America's finest seniors. But there are unique attributes of the population that perhaps point to specific things we can learn uh, about the best way to take care of seniors as they age. And you each have different perspectives. And I, I wonder if you wouldn't share your views about what makes the San Diego aging community unique in that way. Well, in terms of sure. Uh, well, I think uh, a couple of things. I think first of all, I mean, in some respects, we're, we're like the rest of the country. As Nick pointed out, the number of seniors that we're going to have in this country we're going to double by the time we get to 2030, and then the aging, the oldest old, will be with us beyond that. In San Diego, I think there's a couple of things that are unique. The first is the lack of income adequacy for a significant portion of the seniors. The, the Elder Economic Security Initiative Elder Index that was done by the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research tells us that four in ten seniors in San Diego County don't have enough money for things like housing, health care, transportation, and food. Uh, and we could go into a whole discussion about how that relates to the federal poverty level, but that's a significant number of seniors who don't have enough money to meet basic needs. And I think the overarching issue for many of them is housing. I mean, we see at senior community centers and at the Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center, many of our seniors are spending 75 to 80 percent of their limited income for substandard housing. And that leaves literally $150, $160 for everything else including their health care. And so that is something I think that's very unique for San Diego. Uh, on the uh, uh, positive side, yeah, we all talk about our weather, not today, but uh, most days. And that actually is a great thing uh, for people who are growing older. Uh, physical activity, not, not uh, exercise necessarily, but physical activity is probably the most powerful thing that we all can do to retain our independence and health as we grow older and even when we're younger obviously and so having a climate where people can get outside and even walk pretty much year-round is a real plus and I think that really is uh, an add to uh, growing older in San Diego uh, we don't have hills we don't have ice we don't have snow uh, and again a huge advantage for those people who can uh, make use of that uh, we also have some great facilities here in the way of health care um, we have a high percentage of managed care uh, penetration, so it's been around the idea of care coordination, at least on the medical side, conceptually, is part of the culture in California, but specifically in, uh, in San Diego. And uh, so I think as we see some of the changes that are associated with the Affordable Care Act, accountable care organizations and medical homes, et cetera, there's already a nidus of that in, in San Diego. We have a lot of senior health plans, senior Medicare Advantage plans. All of them are at least a three-star rating according to uh, CMS. Kaiser is the only one that is a five-star rating. Uh, and, you know, we're just beginning to understand how to even rate plans and understand quality. But we have good facilities, so uh, it's a question of access to them. It's a good deal for people who are poor uh, because with Medicare Advantage, at least now, and historically, there's no uh, necessity to have a supplemental policy, which gets very expensive as you get older. Um, if you're, again, below the poverty level, and Paul knows these rules far better than I do, yeah, you get government assistance to help with that, and going forward, there'll be more people getting that assistance. But if not, it's a significant part of income. People spend a lot of money on health care that's not covered, uh, regardless of their uh, income level. So you see a little bit, you know, this is kind of a big military presence here, you're, you're in the VA. Um, how, give me a, a perspective uh, from, from the, the military VA footprint here. So, 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 you know, the VA has 40, 50 thousand patients in San Diego. We're one of the larger VAs. Um, when it comes to the military footprint, a lot of seniors who have trained in San Diego once they retire want to come back to this area. Um, we have one of the largest homeless veteran populations for that reason, because of housing issues that you mentioned. And we're also seeing that there are seniors uh, who are being pushed out further and further from the city just because of cost of living. Uh, so these are people who 
moving out to East County, North County, further away from the city, and, and the VA has responded to that by creating C box or using telehealth to reach to these patients. Uh, for them, uh, even the bus ride, or which in San Diego is often rare, if you're living in East County, you're going to be driving, uh, is too expensive. So we have to figure out ways to get services to them closer to their homes. I think there's there's a dual pressure, uh, you know, uh, with with cost of living and, and distance. So there's both sort of ge geographic disparity, and income disparity that is being uh, borne by the seniors. Let me stay with you for a second, um, because you know a, an important thing to get from each of you is kind of uh, the the success stories around some of the technology that's being used for care coordination, a really trendy concept of just making sure that people are getting some form of healthcare integrated into their uh, their activities of daily living, perhaps, or when that when that's possible. The, the VA has been a bit of a leader in um, the application of some of this technology. Can you speak to some of that? Sure. So, you know, there's, there's a few things that distinguish the VA from sort of our general healthcare model. Uh, one of them was the fact that, as, as far as seniors go, you know, we have almost half our population, 60 and above, 60 and older. So 12, 12 and a half million veterans in 2010 were 60 and above. Uh, so for us, seniors is not a special population. They are our population. Any research we do, any clinical work we do, we are dealing with an average population of 65, 67, if you look at the, the, the spread. So everything that we developed from the ground up was designed to service that population. Thing that the VA had which, which made us successful was the fact we had an interoperable unified electronic health record system which allowed us to share data. I think without that platform it would have been very difficult to provide any outreach telehealth using uh, those types of services. And the third thing was we did not have the same um, pressures or not fitting with the sort of long term care that we want to from the community. But I think things are changing with the Accountable Care Act and all the changes that are happening that are sort of moving towards a similar model where there's an adoption of EHRs, there's going to be reimbursement for providing long-term services. So I think those are the, the key ingredients beyond specific technologies. Well, thanks. Getting to the specific technologies, Paul, I want to share a little bit about uh, Independa and, and the approach that you guys are taking toward uh, helping with care coordination? Sure. Uh, Independent, first of all, is a software company. And so we aggregate and integrate a number of platforms. So uh, as the Little Mermaid said, we have gadgets and gizmos and all of that. Uh, but we've also addressed the uh, I want more. And the I want more is social engagement. And we do that through a unique partnership with LG Television. So we're taking a household commodity something that seniors are in front of probably too much of the time, and turning that into a vehicle for social engagement, as well as for alerts, reminders, and a number of other features. So it's something that's easy to use, it's something they're already using, uh, and uh, we see that as a huge uh, step forward in actually connecting people, because nobody really wants to be monitored, nobody really wants to be old, um, and have, <clears throat> gosh, I saw, uh, a picture of a device yesterday that tells you where the person is in the home. Uh, it's a passive uh, falls detector, and it also gets your pulse. And it's about this big and sits on your wrist. And uh, not too long ago, we had a uh, woman who was just about 100 years old who was visiting us when we were, Rory, where are you? When we were in the incubator in the Admiral. Uh, and uh, we had a device that was made in Israel that looked very similar to that. And uh, we showed it to her, and immediately, without missing a beat, she said, I would never wear that. <laughs> so, so again, it's developing technology that's transparent, easy to use, and familiar. And so that's, that's what we're doing. And so uh, we're doing a lot of the things that other people are doing. But I think the key differentiator for us is the platform for social, social engagement. So uh, lots of applications. We can go into that afterwards probably, but uh, huge applications. And I spent uh, 32 years with Kaiser Permanente uh, before I joined Independent three and a half years ago. And much of my career, I'm a geriatrician, but I worked locally here in San Diego, regionally, and then nationally for 11 years, developing programs for older people important part of my experience in all of that time was when I was here in San Diego making home visits. It was transformational. 
because as a healthcare professional, all of my training and career was in a medical office or in a hospital. When you get into people's homes and you see where the real action is and where they spend 99.9% .9 of their time, then you get an understanding if your eyes are open. So Paul, I went to Potrero, to Ramona, to Vista, to Valley Center. I mean, I know, used to know this county like the back of my hand, but it was in visiting those people that I began to really understand what it really required to try to help solve for the problem. So we can push stuff at people forever. We can develop, develop gadgets and gizmos, but unless we really engage them, make the technology easy, we'll never be able to leverage it. So I could go on and on, but. Sure. Uh, so, so Paul, we've heard about the importance of going to people's homes. You deal with a population, many of whom don't have homes. Right. Uh, and, and so talk about how you integrate you know, the, the notion of providing meals, which some can't afford, and healthcare, which many can't afford, and putting that all in some, some rubric for the, the folks that you help to take care of at the senior center. How does that work? Well, I think there, 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 there's a couple things. And one is, for, what we try to do is pull together sort of a holistic and one-stop one approach where we pull the resources together. Uh, so we have a lot of collaboration. We have 25 collaborative partners that we bring under one roof because if our population, if somebody comes in for a meal and we notice something's going on either medically or socially, um, I mean, we, we sort of practice, you know, the old thing about management by walking around. We, we, we provide case management by walking around and interacting. And so it's literally taking somebody by the, the hand. You know, why don't we go chat and let's, we'll chat with the social worker and, oh, you know what, we better, you know, the nurse is here. Let me introduce you to Christine, our nurse, or Marissa, our nurse, while you have them. You can't say come back a week from Thursday at 2.30 for a 15-minute appointment and we'll take care of you. You've got to be able to provide the services with this population when you've, you've got them. And I think the, the importance of technology is going to become more important in the future because what we're going to have to do is be able to utilize a large cadre of non-medically trained personnel out there as our eyes and ears who are able to refer and connect you know, electronically with people who are medically trained. For example, for us, we serve 500 homebound meals a day. So I have drivers who, pay drivers who go in you know, five days a week, they deliver seven days worth of meals in five days, but they see these people. And so having those people be able to have the ability to help refer into a geriatric nurse uh, to be able to intervene is going to be important. And I think the other side of technology is, and this is sort of for those of us in the nonprofit world, is that we really need to up our game in terms of collecting data. Historically, I think we've all said, well, we do good, you know, that's, that's nice. But I think having the data to be able to make decisions, particularly given the demographics that we're talking about, we're going to have to be as cost effective and be able to leverage as much as possible, or else there's no way we're going to be able to take care of, you know, 90 million people over the age of 65 in another 20 years. We've hit on two important themes. I'll try to take them separately. One is it's not about the gizmo or the gadget. Um, although there are many people in the audience, some of the people here at the Institute, who are working on bits and pieces of technology that can enable care coordination. We've heard about a spectrum of um, the elder population in terms of their background, their experiences, their resources. Um, so is it, is it fair to say that we're going to not have um, a one-size-fits-all solution, that we're going to really be forced to work and meet people where they are? I mean, so, so, so Paul, you, you, you're, you're looking at a, a pretty diverse group, even though they're all at one end of the spectrum, they're still nonetheless diverse. Um, Richard, you're going to, to people's homes and providing monitors of uh, activities of daily living and their social interaction. And, and the VA is working with technology that is deployed remotely, um, oftentimes folks who are so far away they don't get to visit their doctors very often. It seems as though that, that we're de-emphasizing any particular technology and more emphasizing a, an entire spectrum or a palette mm -hmm. so we can meet everyone where they are. As, as we go to do that, what are the special challenges that you see? Um, I think out there right now, we have a lot of proprietary systems, so it makes integration very difficult. So again, Independa's approach has always been to be an integrator, 
And so we're, except for the TV, the LG TV, and for, for very practical reasons, we're really uh, device agnostic. So as things evolve, uh, we can always offer better best of a particular device or a solution. And so I think, again, one of the barriers that we face right now is, again, that people have single or two-point solutions, and it's aggregating those. So we talk about healthcare being fragmented. I think the technology space is also very, uh, very fragmented. So the challenge is to integrate it. I think, I think you have to look at the diversity of the population. So a lot of our seniors, a lot of our veterans don't have Wi-Fi in their home. So if you're going to deploy a device, it better work either through a plain old telephone system, which the VA used for the longest time, uh, or you provide them with some sort of access to the internet. We assume that cell phone penetration is high. So if you, from a recent VA data, there's around 70% cell phone ownership in the veteran population, but only 20% smartphones or phones that can connect to the internet. So you have to take that into account. And one of the things the VA did early on was they tried to match the solution to the patient's needs. So if the patient can only receive phone calls, then we did care coordination through phone calls. The patient can receive, you know, uh, data over the internet, then we use the internet. So you have to have flexibility in your approach. If I could just add, for example, with the television, um, some people don't need the features on the television. We have a tablet for those who are more facile and can use that form factor. But uh, for the dementia population, how are we going to impact dementia care, memory care? Because again, of people with dementia, either early onset dementia or, you know, the more typical older age onset is growing. It's becoming a major cause of uh, disability and death among older people. So even there, uh, we can deliver photographs. Uh, one of the mainstays of memory care is reminiscence therapy. So again, you say, well, how can, well, we, if they wander, that's easy. That's a technology solution. But there are even social engagement solutions that can reach a population of people with dementia. Uh, so, uh, agreed, the diversity is great, and the solutions have to be flexible. And that's a challenge, because you want things to be simple, but when they become flexible, it creates complex uh, complexity. So, uh, uh, you're constantly weighing those two. And if I could piggyback on that, when we talk about flexibility, I mean, that's something that we see on a, on a regular basis, is how you approach. I talked about the case management by walking in. You really have to, we, we sort of all here in this room would assume if somebody is homeless and chronic diseases and whatnot that of course they're going to want help. They're going to want to come in and give me everything you've got and that's not not the case. Uh, uh, Dr. Kate Pettigrew who's back here who we work with shared with me a story about a 63 year old man who is a chronic alcoholic homeless and uh, working with all sorts of different resources and you know he had balance problems and one of the issues was you know he needed a walker. Well, he felt when he went in to get meals in one of the, in the homeless shelters wearing, with a walker, he was a target. And apparently he had been assaulted. So we would assume, of course, a walker is a good thing, that that would be helpful. His eyes, it was a big target on his back. So it's understanding where they're at and trying, you know, having to do workarounds where it may not be ideal. Um, and in some cases, too, you can be overly aggressive. You have to a soft approach and work with them and build trust. And that's something that our staff at the Wellness Center focuses on is building trust. So we don't come at them throwing everything at them the day they walk in. It's, you know, uh, Sam, let's get to know each other. Let's have a cup of coffee. We'll have lunch together and build a rapport and then try to deal with some of the, the issues because uh, otherwise you'll get resistance. It's, uh, it's, it's all good to be reminded of that kind of human element. I mean, there's a lot of technology developers who are enamored with the promise of technology. And there's a bit of a, of a dichotomous dialogue around uh, seniors and their willingness to accept or integrate with technology. On one hand, you know, it's, uh, it, there's, a, there's a discussion that goes, well, you know, they, um, the, the seniors really don't want to play with the, that new stuff. And on the other hand, as we look at the boomers turning 65 at, 10,000 a day, we're, we're, th these are folks who are impatient to have the technology that meets their needs. What, do you, what, do you, what would you tell the technology developers here about um, how they should look at uh, an, an aging population with respect to their affinity for, for technology play a role? So in our, in our research and, and both clinical work, 
we haven't met any resistance from seniors per se in terms of using technology uh, any more than anybody else. I would even say uh, for most of the seniors, if the technology <coughs> is plug and play and they can use it, which for most people, that's one of the basic entry requirements. If it requires you to go back and reset your router settings and firewall settings, forget yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. If it requires you to enter pass scores to match a Bluetooth device, forget it. If it's going to run out of battery, forget it. And that's for everybody. It's not just the seniors. So we need to come up with a model of technology which is dead simple to use, reliable. You can deliver it to somebody's home without having to send a technology person or an IT guy to their house to set it up. And I think that is the challenge we are facing. We're doing a study right now where we're going to have four arms of you know, in-home therapy for psychotherapy, in-home sort of tablet device, or PDA or whatever, or bring your own device. And it's a nightmare trying to set up all these devices to work interoperably and securely with our network. And that's the biggest challenge we are facing in setting up these home telemedicine video conferencing systems. Um, so there's a lot to be done on the technology, and I think, Joe, to make things simple. I would add, I mean, I think I agree that it, it, it needs to be simple, but I would say that anybody who says a senior can't use technology, that's a problem. Because we, we see that on a daily basis. We have a cyber cafe that is one of the most popular areas in our entire facility. And, but what it takes is it takes sort of a little bit of patience and somebody to show the senior how to do it. Um, I mean, for us, it, you know, for many of us, it, it's now sort of intuitive. I mean, I remember a number of years ago, uh, you know, I got a gift of an iPod at it, and there were no instructions with it. I was expected to sort of intuitively know how to how to make it work, but you know, and so it took my son to show me how to do it. I needed it. But seniors are sort of kind of the same thing. If you have somebody who's showing them how to do it and get over that initial fear of touching the mouse or touching the screen and doing something, they get into it, uh, and it, because it's just as intuitive at 75 as it is at 15, so long as you know how to do it. Now, I think in cases when you know, you're older and maybe dementia, again, I think having it be as simple as possible to connect. We're about to launch the Virtual Senior Center uh, pilot project in coordination with Aging and Independent Services. And it's going to be a very simple device in people's homes, literally a simple touch screen, where people will be able to interact, take classes, socialize. But it, the applicability for telemedicine is huge. Um, and it doesn't require a lot of training. And I think that's the direction that we, you know, we need to be able to go because some of the most difficult population we serve are our homebound because they're the ones that don't get the socialization that they need. And we all know the relationship of mental health to physical health. And so that's an important area in anything we do is to make sure that we're, we're dealing with the socialization portion. One thing to just qualify the idea of simple technology, I think a lot of people misunderstand when we say simple. It's simple for the user. It's highly sophisticated for the developer or the software. So anything that is dead simple is actually more sophisticated on the back end. Yeah, or under the hood, it has to have more tools that allow voice interaction, gestures, or whatever, easier menu commands. Uh, you know, so I think that's the challenge. It's a great point to have the yeah. sophistication match and exceed the complexity exactly. so that you create easy use. Yeah, and I, and I think in general, it's true of all of us, but I think it becomes more true as we get older. It's really is what am I getting for my level of effort or investment in learning this technology or anything new. So again, if it's too hard for me to learn, I'm going to probably quickly dismiss that. So if again, if it's I have to keep it charged, if I have to find it, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it's not going to be useful uh, useful uh, to me. So I think that's a, a an important characteristic to keep in mind as well. A great segue. What am I getting for the investment? Um, right. So um, <laughs> each each of you, in fact, all of us are um, competing in some way. For resources, whether it's mind share or whether it's uh, nonprofit dollars or whether it's it's customers, um, demonstration of value, not not virtue. I think we all appreciate the virtuous nature of, of making sure that our, our seniors do better, live longer, stay out of the hospital. But demonstration of value, proving that what we're doing is is a worth the bang for the buck. How 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 do you see that as a burden? How do you look to achieve? some evidence base that would give others confidence that extending what you're doing is in everyone's best interest. I think the biggest burden is that we have this chasm between social services and healthcare system. I mean, the funding streams are entirely different. There are two different worlds. 
Uh, so much of healthcare is, again, facility-based, hospitals, offices. Um, people don't live in those places. And uh, uh, yet people are social, social beings. So the, the geriatric paradigm is that when you look at function, independence, quality of life, it's medical care that's part of it. But so is environment. So is your economic environment, your, your social uh, network. Uh, cognitive, emotional, all of these things play a role in independence and, and function. So if we look at our two major streams, though, or three major streams, mental health, social services, and you know, traditional medical care, there's huge chasms that exist in not only the funding, but also their interoperability. So that's a huge burden, because if I, in a social service area, show a return of investment, not for me necessarily, but for the healthcare system, that doesn't get me anything. Well, maybe you can uh, you can speak to that. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean that's one of the challenges. Is if, if, if we save Sharp Healthcare you know, a bundle of money, you know, they may thank us. But that, but I think it's showing broader systems. So for us as a nonprofit, I think it's not only showing our funders what I call social ROI that their investment is creating something good in the community, even if somebody else is is, is benefiting. Or, or government, you know, is, is benefiting, being able to show with you know scarce government dollars to invest in, in what we're doing. And I think I think your point about, particularly in the social service world, the nonprofit world, one of the challenges that and I'm speaking broadly is that we have to understand the importance of data and being able to say, so what is our our end game of what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, you know, I, I often say one of the things that senior citizens we have 350 units of low income. Um, or and also all the people we support in their in their homes. When somebody passes away in their home, that's a success. See that as a success. I mean, it's sad, all that, but it's it's a success because they didn't die in an emergency room, a hospital, or a skilled nursing facility. If you ask them, they certainly know who's who here would raise their hand and say, I want to be, I want to die in a skilled nursing facility or an ER. I don't think anybody would. So we view success is by being able to keep people in their homes, and we all know that the cost of skilled nursing, hospitals, et cetera. So what we need to be able to do, though, is connect that intuitive. I mean, we're all intuitively, I think, that it's collecting the data. And I think in the nonprofit world, so often um, I describe that we're, you know, many of us are focused on our shoes as far as our vision because we're worried about the funding for tomorrow, surviving today, and our long-term vision and is surviving tomorrow, and we need to start looking down the road with all of this demographics uh, that we talked about to be able to prove that we are providing value and being able to connect whether it's the healthcare system to government to other places and show that we have a true value um, and that we are worthy of investment, whether it's philanthropic dollars, governmental dollars, or if we're able to develop our own earned income streams because we're providing value. And certainly I think some of the opportunities out there with the dual eligibles and whatnot provide some of that. And so you, you touch upon a really important area, and as a researcher, I struggle with the whole cost effectiveness or the, or the value proposition of health IT and telehealth. And it's been on the table for 10, 15 years. We've been doing this, uh, still lacking information. And there's this particular uh, unique issues with it. One is, you know, the traditional model, model of evaluating cost effectiveness for diseases is very disease-based. You have a treatment. You compare it to another treatment, you see quality of life years or whatever cost effectiveness, and you can make policy decisions based on that. And often, well, if you do a five year RCT with a technology, by the time you're done, you probably can't even support that technology. It's not even provided anymore. You need to buy the new one. So that's a challenge. Uh, getting long term outcome data, which is really what's important in chronic disease. So you can show 30 day regression as a short, day, short term outcome, but to show that these patients have less chronic renal failure or don't develop heart disease or don't die of strokes will take 10, 15 years of follow-up. There are still no studies that are going to that, that extent. Uh, so a lot of the value proposition is, is lacking due to those yeah. gaps in research and funding. As, as difficult it is, isn't it also essential? I mean, you know, we, we are going to have tough decisions to make. Resources are finite. We've got to do a, a good job, but we've got to do, in some way, push ourselves to do the most efficient job we can every time. And so how does one build into um, product approval or product development the notion that at the end of the day, I've got to show that 
I'm saving the system money uh, versus the status quo, or that in order to build another senior center, I've got to I've got to demonstrate that the monies that we provided did actually net um, a, a better outcome, or at least the same outcome at a lower at a lower cost. Don't, don't we have to do that? And what's yeah. required? What are what are the missing pieces? Uh, probably policy payment and practice uh, that they're not aligned. And um, uh, so there are some actually very good interventions. So a lot of focus right now on this thing called transitional care. When people leave the hospital, go home, you know, it used to be dis discharge meant dismissed. You know, you're, you're out of here. Uh, whereas now CMS uh, is uh, developing uh, penalties and rewards, but penalties for hospitals that have higher than expected, risk adjusted, but higher than expected readmission rates. So there's now motivation for hospitals to care about what happens when people leave their door. Because in the fee-for-service, or as some people call it, fee-for-volume world, if they came back, the meter started running again. So there was no motivation, really, to keep the, uh, per, uh, the person out of the hospital. So uh, uh, those uh, uh, institutions, insurance plans, like the VA, like Kaiser, like any, any organizations that is at risk, so it's more capitated payment, there's more motivation for them to at least look at some short-term ROI. So if I can use a proven intervention and then extend that intervention's reach through technology and its effectiveness through technology, then I can show an ROI pretty quickly. And so places like Geisinger, and the VA has published some information on at least some of the chronic disease management, uh, uh, that they're can be an ROI that's shown short term. Uh, so I think my opinion, based on what you were saying, Dr. Khan, too, is that we have to look at more short term ROIs and uh, uh, show it to the people who are at risk. Uh, everybody looks at technology that I've met and say, gee, that's really neat stuff. Um, but there are very few people who are going to be the innovators and the early adapters. You know, they're going to be sort of towards the middle of the bell curve or the laggers at the other end. Uh, so that's a real challenge, too. It's the cultural acceptance uh, 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 by different uh, institutions, healthcare or otherwise, of actually using the same tool. Well, we're going to have time to do RPCs. Exactly. And one of the things I think that, that we need to do, whether in the healthcare world, nonprofit world, is we need to be able to answer the question so what? You know, I serve a meal to a senior, so what? It's nice, they're, they're not hungry, but I could, I could take them to McDonald's and buy them a double cheeseburger, large order fries, large chocolate shake, and they wouldn't be hungry. So I need to be able to answer the what question. What have they done to you that would make you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, but, but you know, you could argue that they're not hungry. But, yeah. but the question is, you need to be able to answer is, so, so, so what? We, we served them a meal. What happened because of the meal? And that's, I think, the, the bridge that particularly those of us in the nonprofit world need to make because historically, you know, we serve meals. That's a good thing. And, you know, congratulations. We serve, you know, however many thousands of meals. We, we must have done good by doing all of that. But what we need to be able to do is articulate that because we serve the meal, that senior is healthier. They're going to the ER less, fewer hospital days, and delaying, deferring long-term care. And we need to be able to ask that so what question on everything that we're doing. What happens because of that? And is that a, co is that a cost effective way? Because we can certainly throw a lot of money and answer, you know, come up with really good answers to so what, but we've got to do so in a cost effective way. And it keeps coming back to demographics. When you've got 90 million seniors, we have to be efficient or we're going to go broke. Uh, another thing just came to mind, a very important thing my development in this area of technology and working with Independa. But I had the opportunity about three years ago to visit some communities in Europe where, again, social and medical are more aligned in the sense of budget and, and outcomes that people are looking for. Um, and uh, this was in Scotland. This was a small village west of Edinburgh where for now it's about 10 years, 11 years, they used a very simple array of primarily activity safety and some health monitoring and sensor uh, uh, installation. And they were able to demonstrate, they went from a pilot of about 89 people in this one town in 2002, went to two, 
uh, um, to 4,000 by 2010. So that's a pretty good scale. Uh, they looked at the outcomes not only in healthcare, but again in delayed placement at a higher level of care. And they found very significant uh, differences between uh, uh, that town and the rest of Stockholm during that time period. So they did not have a, again, the benefit of a randomized controlled trial, the comparison group, but as a result of that, that became national policy in Scotland within a couple of years that every town in Scotland needs to provide this as a service. Different formulas for paying for it, either it's completely provided to people, depending on income or for anybody, or there's some co-payment involved. But it just shows how other governments have approached this area of integrating technology with social services and medical care, and they were able to demonstrate, again, maybe not rigidly, but rigorously, the return on investment and how very quickly that's led to the national policy. I can't imagine that happening. Yeah. It's, it's sad that you can't imagine it happening here in, in, in many ways. Um, so, so, Paul, uh, Nick alluded to Passport uh, for Health, uh, a, a program that you know, you're helping to run at the Senior Center that integrates a little bit of health care together with uh, the, the daytime senior facilities and, mm -hmm. and, and the, the meal provision. Talk a little bit about that. Well, hopefully, and hopefully in, in, during breakfast there was a display I hope you had a chance to look at it, but it's centered around a, a wireless health kiosk that measures a series of biometrics, including blood pressure, weight, BMI, is able to do uh, eye test. It also does a general health screen uh, that is able to be, well, is able to be displayed for the, the senior to be able to see as they're doing. It's a very simple display and sort of back to our question of technology. Seniors are able to use it. Um, we have people in the, officially in the passport, and I'll talk about it in a second, we just have the people who are using this machine on a regular basis coming in to check their blood pressure. So it's very simple to use, but what happens is it, it is wirelessly, it, it uploads into our efforts to outcome software, which is a database where we track every single thing that we do as far as the seniors are concerned, from meals to whether they go to the Tai Chi class, see a social worker, et cetera. The idea is it goes to our uh, geriatric uh, care coordinator who is an advanced practice nurse and she is able to monitor the data. And the idea is, the most fundamental level, is to be able to intervene before a crisis occurs. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. So this, this passport program, we, uh, we have IRB approval. We have we're going to have 300 people enrolled, 150 in the trial, 150 as a control group. And the idea will be to monitor them on an ongoing basis to determine what kinds of um, what trends in their health, interventions that are necessary, working on regular meetings with our nurse who will attempt to make sure they have a primary care physician, be looking at some of the social issues and bringing in a social worker if necessary to deal with all of the wraparound issues that are going on, but connect them to the resources that they need, um, again, before something bad occurs. Um, we'll also have a great deal of data so that if something bad does occur, we're going to be able to share with their physician you know, several months worth of biometric data, you know, they, you know, they would be able to spot, spot things. The idea, or hopefully one of the goals, is to develop a simple app that, again, a non-medically trained person is going to be able to do some uh, intake of some information and be able to give the uploading process that I talked about a few minutes ago, I think will be one of the long-term goals of it. But I think it, it's, it's a very important first step in us, the leveraging that I was talking about, by using this, I mean, we're able to have one nurse right now is going to be dealing with 150 clients, patients, uh, and be able to do so effectively because it's it's going to start this funneling process. And I think that's the fundamental thing that we're going to be have to do regardless of what we do, uh, and regardless of the interventions on any kind of uh, health care, is we've got to figure out a way to be efficiently get information to those who are decision makers and can intervene and utilize non-medically trained people as the funnelers and do that as efficiently as possible. It's sort of going back, there used to be something called the universal health worker. I don't know if you remember that, some of you, who could do lots of things, but then with licensing and guilds forming, only we could do this and only you could do that. And so these people who you want to engage are kind of pushed out because of licensing and so-called scope of practice. So, uh, so many things interconnected, uh, so much to do. 
So a, a thing that's kept come up, I think everybody's used the word information. Everybody's used the word coordination. Um, you know, the San Diego community, I think, is noteworthy in that it is a more collaborative and competitive environment. We've got folks here from the Beacon Project and the, the local HIE. You know, how, how do we get a little bit more of working together to solve this problem? Because, you know, listening to, the, listening to the three of you each have examples of excellence and, and, and opportunities that you're pursuing, and yet I, I don't necessarily sense that we're all working yet together as much as we need to. And, and as, I, as I listen to the story from the, the HIE, the opportunity for kind of information sharing at a community level, that seems like it's adding enough. Is it or are there other hurdles that are currently in the way? And I'd open that up. I mean, are there, are there regulatory hurdles? Are there reimbursement hurdles? You know, we, we benefit. Um, our benefactors have given us the opportunity to set up a policy center in D.C. So we're quite interested in working at a policy level to tear down some of those obstacles that are in the way. But maybe there's some local obstacles that we can deal with with you know an engaged community that's in the room. I, I think it's one. It's maybe changing the way we we look at things. And I'm glad you actually reminded me about the Beacon Project. We're, that's one of the key parts of the passport that I neglected to mention is that we're going to be able to have access for people in this project if they are call 911. We're going to know that and be able to intervene and do that follow up when hopefully they're they're discharged shortly. So I think it's it's understanding what the opportunities are, but. I think it's, it's changing the prism through which all of us are looking at this because I think there's, there is a bit of a siloed approach. This is what we do, this is what the healthcare system does, this is what the government does. But I think embracing collaboration, I mean, that's one of the fundamental things that we've done at senior community centers and is exhibited at the Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center is embracing the collaboration. As I mentioned, we have 25 collaborative partners from San Diego State to UCSD to Sharp Healthcare. Uh, obviously, all sorts of folks from the Insti Health Institute here are, are involved, but embracing, truly embracing that. And I think a lot of us in the, in the nonprofit world, you know, have forced collaborations. You know, if you, you want to get the money, you got to, and that's the wrong attitude. We have to embrace collaboration and not, there, there's enough business for all of us that we don't need to compete with each other. We need to collaborate with each other and leverage the resources that each of us brings to the table. But it's going to require a mindset change, I think, across the board, which is a lot easier said than, than done, but I think the work that is being done here is the, the critical start to that because that's the, the vision that Gary and Mary West have and this, this, the Institute and the Foundation to helpfully start moving us down that path. And I think you're going to start seeing, we're going to have to see that at the national level <coughs> by default. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to be brilliant and, and see it for the right reasons, but for the wrong reasons, they're going to have to eventually get to there. Yeah, I think there are tons of opportunities. So the VA is part of the Beacon Project. We're also part of Wheeler, uh, exchanging health information with Kaiser, with UCSD. Both there are positive forces that are pushing us in that direction, and I think the biggest force is our patients. They no more show up to our office with printed discharge summaries and printed <laughs> medical records from their other doctor. They expect us to see it online. Say, well, why can't you see my labs from Kaiser? Why should I go and get poked again today? I just mm -hmm. had them done six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We have a large, significant population of patients who go to multiple institutions. They go for their specialty care to UCSD. They get their primary care at, at the VA. So that's a big driver. Uh, uh, the other is things like meaningful use, you know, health policy change, which is forcing you to be interoperable, share information <clears throat> across sites. Uh, I think the issues are more more than technology, I think it is a lot of administrative and legal issues. You know, when we did our health exchange, inf information exchange with Kaiser, I can tell you, uh, I won't give out numbers, but the ratio of lawyers to engineers was four to one. <laughs> <laughs> For every engineer on the project, there are four lawyers. So I mean, unless we can bridge that gap and, and get everybody to play nice. <laughs> Well, terrific. So we're, we're, um, we're nearing our time fence, and I wanted to open it up a bit for folks in the audience who had either specific contributions to make or specific questions to, to ask of the distinguished panel or give us some additional uh, items to think about as we, as we try to take this forward. So please, don't be shy. Palomar Health Foundation in North Inland County. And I'm curious, is anybody initiating something like seniors to senior Peace Corps? Uh, because there are so many retirees or dis, uh, disabled people that could engage in meaningful uh, volunteer work. And it seems that some of the solutions 
aren't based in really funding, but maybe in volunteerism. Could I mention, uh, you know, have you heard about the village movement? Okay. Uh, village movement is something that started on a different beacon. Beacon Hill in Boston is where this started, where uh, communities that have probably a higher prevalence of older people in general uh, come together. So Tierra Santa has uh, got a village. Mm -hmm. There's one at Scripps Ranch, and I think one in South Bay, Paul? I think so. I think so. But it's volunteers. Uh, and so it's typically people who are older, maybe over 55 or, um, you know, in their 60s and 70s, but more fit people who are volunteering to help seniors who are less able, more vulnerable. And uh, it's kind of uh, uh, paying it forward. So the idea is that you, when you become frail and elderly and isolated and less mobile, people will take you to the doctor, walk your dog on a rainy day. Uh, but also we envision those communities being the people who respond to alerts that uh, technology generates so that they will be the neighbors next door down the street who can come in and check uh, when something happens that you don't expect to happen or don't want to happen. So that's one example. Well, and I think that uh, <clears throat> volunteering is critically important. I mean, we all need a reason to get up in the morning. And unfortunately for a lot of seniors, there isn't that compelling reason to get up in the morning. So having a meaningful volunteer experience that utilizes some of the skills and expertise. You know, we, we didn't touch on, but with all the demographics of all these people hitting traditional retirement age of 65, there's a lot of talent mm -hmm. that is retiring, theoretically moving into retirement. So we need to tap into that both as a community, you know, and I know AIS has their RSVP program. We have a very robust civic engagement program where we're finding meaningful volunteer, volunteer activities. And, I, and underlying the word meaningful uh, is, is important but we've got to utilize those resources. But again, it's back to that mental health, is you have to have a purpose for getting up and having something to contribute uh, in, back into society. So I think building more civic engagement, more meaningful volunteer, there's a whole other area of, of even employment. I mean, retraining older workers to stay in the workforce, maybe not working 40 hours a week, but we've got to, to do that. Uh, you know, we look at our unemployment numbers today and it looks Odd to say that by 2030, we may have trouble filling jobs if everybody who hits 65 retires. So that's a, all of those things kind of go together on the mental health side of the equation. <clears throat> and I'll Please. just share with aging and independent services, one of the things that we're doing right now is utilizing lay leaders, older adults who serve as trainers for chronic disease self-management, diabetes self-management classes sure. that are six weeks in length. And I think older adults want to hear and be trained by other older adults who they can relate to. Sure. Just to add to that, uh, that intervention has shown a clear ROI uh, again to the healthcare system. You can either have one, none or two mics. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm from Evita. We are building a uh, mobile app for patients with uh, uh, chronic medical conditions. And uh, one thing about Dr. Aga I want to ask is you mentioned that, um, good validation that there is no resistance from seniors in using technology. Uh, and since we are building a technology app which we hope that seniors will use, at the same time, you did mention that there are only 20% penetration of smartphones, right? And given that feature phones are almost the past, I mean, yes, they are cheaper than smartphones at this point in time, but uh, as uh, Android or iOS devices are uh, getting better and better, there are cheaper options available. So I'm assuming that there will be a lot of penetration of smartphones too. And the uh, question is, are you seeing the same? Uh, and is there a play of mobile apps in, in providing care to senior as well? And, and uh, uh, Dr. Penaon, so you did mention that independent uh, developing uh, uh, apps on the uh, tablets, but uh, is there any plans to develop on smartphones? And if not, why? Well, we have plans for smartphones for caregivers. 
because there are you know, two sides of this. Um, but I think for most of the people in our target uh, uh, market, uh, the form factor is not right. It's too small. I mean, I'm older. I really have, you know, have to take out my glasses. And my thumbs are getting thicker. Uh, it's, it's just not the easiest form factor to, uh, for me to use. I'm pretty tech savvy and, and used to technology. Uh, I think you know, the, the tablet, by the way, is a lockdown tablet. You can't get lost. You know, you, you, all you have on that tablet is our app, um, which the senior um, interacts with. Uh, and so for some seniors, uh, and it's, surpri it's surprising to me to see some of the people who want the tablet, uh, but some do want the tablet. The current cohort of older people are most, friend uh, most uh, comfortable with the television. Uh, so I think it's important as you develop your app to see you know, usability. Are, are they going to uh, be comfortable using uh, a smartphone? Uh, the only reason I was thinking of the mobile phone is given that, uh, as Dr. Aga said, it should be firstly simple and reliable and should be networked in the sense that uh, if it is standalone, uh, to, to make any connection with the provider is going to be tough. If it's on a phone, that you can use uh, the, the uh, phone features itself to make a call or, or use the internet features built within, it, it's much easier. Than right. By the uh, way, uh, Jitterbug, you know, Mm -hmm. whole company has come out with a smartphone. I saw it advertised. I've not seen it, so I don't know how easy that's to use, but their basic phone is incredibly easy to use. A lot of the work, if you look at the literature and things that have worked, have actually been more standalone devices. And the reason is they're easier to use to serve one purpose. If you look at the old Health Buddy, it looks like a toaster with a screen on it. <laughs> All right, no offense, but it's very effective. Mm -hmm. It's that simple to use. So you have to weigh those uh, advantages of having a smartphone with multiple functions and being mobile, which all of us cherish, versus having a device, this is what I can touch this red button to call my doctor. And here's the screen that I'm going to get the prompt on and not confuse it with anything else. So there is this trade-off that you have to consider when developing tools for in-home care. One last question, and then we'll free up the audience. A lot about the uh, collaboration, trying to get the health services, and the social services and mental health. And if you look at technologies, is there any collaboration that you're going to be able to have a device in the home and that senior or their caregiver is going to have resources to find out what is in the community? Because I think that's a challenge for a lot of seniors who are eligible for some of the high touch human capital type resources. But there's so many actually in San Diego, they don't know what they're eligible for. So you're right. I think getting all this. We focus a lot on technology, but really what's needed is system redesign, which what we started doing, we developed these what we call patient-centered care teams, PAC teams. And if you look at what is, what's in the team, each team has a physician, a social worker, a clinical pharmacist, an LVN, and an RN. And it's the job of the social worker to help coordinate all the services from the, say, in the community, whether through the VA. I think we need to move towards the sort of holistic model of care where you have social services uh, people who can help find jobs, find even transportation for the patient as part of the healthcare team. Uh, Dr. Khan, I also read recently that there's a, a trial going on at the VA with iPads given to caregivers to essentially provide them with the resources that you're talking about. So very practical tips about how to deal with a particular problem in, a, uh, say, somebody with Alzheimer's disease, but also a portal to services that are available in, in your community. And I think I, if I could jump in, I mean, I think a lot of the resources are here. It's that people don't know about them, and there's not an easy way to find out about them. I mean, if I had, you know, magic wand or was king for a day, I would say, you know, in high school there ought to be a class about, you know, caregiving. You know, I remember when back when I was in high school, I had to take shop and you know, things like <laughs> that. But but if you think about it, the young people, someone who's 20 years old, 25 years old. They, that person is going to be that sandwich generation in 2030, mm -hmm. 2035 with kids and, and older relatives and understanding the resources. I mean, you know, we, we deal with low-income seniors who come to us and have no fam family support. But I can also tell you, we get a lot of calls from people who are, are don donors, who are wealthy, educated, and suddenly uh, grandma has some problems and they have absolutely no idea what to do when grandma has been discharged from the hospital and 
all of these things are, are going on. And there are resources out there to deal with it, but figuring out a, a way to coordinate it, an easy way, uh, but also I think just educating our, our population about these issues, because I don't care how old you are, if you were born, you know, whatever the royal baby born a couple of days ago, you may not have to worry about it, but any other kid born a couple of days ago, will be, this will be with them for their entire life, you know, at least until 2050 and, and beyond. Well, um, thanks to the audience uh, and thanks to our speakers for making today a success. As I pointed out, um, this is, uh, while, while this is an event, it is part of a process. Um, we're not going to solve this today, but uh, hopefully we can encourage some of the information sharing and the collaboration and the coordination that we've talked about by events like this and the follow, the follow on. Um, tweet, Twitter, you know, there's a, a lot of that going on today. Um, that's, just, that's just another vehicle for continuing the conversation. So so I'd ask, I'd ask you to thank our, our panel for giving up some of their day today. <laughs>